What can we do to be happier? Can money buy happiness if we spend it wisely? How do smartphones impact our happiness and what can we do about it? Can we still be happy in the midst of a pandemic? These are some of the questions that my guest today has spent her career researching. I'm thrilled to be dipping my toes into the social sciences with today's discussion of happiness. It's hard to think of a topic with greater potential to impact our quality of life. Dr. Elizabeth Dunn is an internationally recognized social scientist who specializes in happiness. After completing her bachelor's at Harvard University and her PhD at the University of Virginia, Dr. Dunn settled here in beautiful Vancouver where she studies happiness at the University of British Columbia and directs the Happy Lab. Dunn is a member of the Royal Society of Canada and has received many awards both for her research and her teaching. She is the co-author of Happy Money, The Science of Happier Spending, and has given several popular talks, including TEDx, TED Talks, and Pop Tech. On a personal note, Dr. Dunn and I both have children in the same elementary school, and I can tell you from the smile on her face that she practices what she preaches. Welcome to Get Real Health. I'm your host, Dr. Chana Davis. This show cuts through the noise to give you science-based insights from real experts so that you can make smart, healthy choices. Dr. Elizabeth Dunn, thank you so much for being here for a chat. I've heard your TED Talks, I've heard you on podcasts, so I'm thrilled to have you to myself here to pepper you with questions about happiness. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I wanted to just start with defining happiness because uh, that's not necessarily an obvious thing. Right. So um, in uh, my field of psychology, we typically define happiness as including three key components. So um, you uh, first we ask people how satisfied they are with their lives. So we look at the extent to which they agree with statements like overall, the conditions of my life are excellent. Um, and this is a more cognitive or reflective um, measure. We also look at how much positive emotion people experience um, on a day to day basis. Um, and finally, we look at how much negative emotion they experience. And, you know, I think it's really important to be clear that just because you have some negative emotions, you know, that doesn't mean you're not a happy person, right? Everybody experiences some negative emotion, mm -hmm. but we would define happiness as um, uh, including, you know, a, a preponderance of positive emotion over negative emotion. So mm -hmm. more positive feelings than negative feelings on a typical day mm -hmm. combined with the sense of being satisfied with your life. So this is sort of like the um, holy trinity of happiness is having high life satisfaction, a lot of positive emotion, and not too much in the way of negative emotion. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that we have some definitions, my sort of scientific analytical gears are shifting, and I'm thinking, how reproducible are happiness measures if you ask the same person, you know, the next day? Yeah, so happiness measures, if anything, are sort of frustratingly stable. Um, so <laughs> it's actually pretty hard to change people's overall level of well-being. Now, if you look at certainly how much positive emotion people are experiencing on any one day, you know, that's going to vary from like a day that just goes perfectly to one of those days where just like everything's kind of going wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But the measure of life satisfaction tends to be much more stable. And if you look over time at like how people typically feel over the course of a week, for example, you'll see um, a lot of stability over time where people who were happy last week will tend to be pretty happy next week. Um, and so one of the big challenges for happiness mm -hmm. research has been figuring out how do you actually lastingly change people's happiness? Because for the most part, there is a major, major component of stability. Okay. So um, the next thing, of course, I can't resist asking is so how does, um, you know, nature versus nurture, uh, and I suppose the stability could actually speak to both if your environment is stable and your genetics are stable, but um, maybe <laughs> dive into that a little bit for us. Yeah, so genetics do play um, a pretty substantial role in shaping happiness levels. Um, so, you know, if you have happy parents, you are more likely to be happy as a child and growing up. Um, and, you know, initially there were some estimates that um, as much as 50% of the variance in happiness might 
have um, a genetic basis. Now people are, researchers are tempering those claims a bit and suggesting, you know, the real figure is probably a bit lower, maybe closer to 30%. There isn't like a super well established, you know, this is the number. Um, uh, And of course, you know, the heritability may even vary across different populations. Um, But uh, I think what's, what's very clear is that there is a substantial genetic contribution to your happiness level. And I think that's important to recognize because it does mean that, you know, this, this gave people, researchers, real reason to be pessimistic initially that we could change levels of happiness. But I think that perhaps reflects a misunderstanding of genetics. You could tell me more about this. Um, but, you know, sometimes when we hear that there's a genetic component, it makes us feel like, oh, okay, well, we can't change it. And, and really what the, the more sophisticated view now is, is, oh, no, like, sure, there's a genetic component, but it, it is also possible to alter um, people's happiness levels. But it, it's not something that just you do with a snap of a finger. Yeah. I think one expression I've heard before is genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. So it definitely sort of points you in a certain direction, but you may or may not go in that direction depending on your environment. Um, is it is the heritability largely from twin studies, those estimates? I believe so, yeah. And I'm, I have not personally ever done a deep dive into yeah. this literature, um, but at least the sort of big well-known studies um, were twin studies. Mm-hmm. So again, just sort of getting a broad picture of happiness here. Um, what can we learn or, or what do we know about who are the happiest people in the world and who are the least happy people in the world? And what can we learn from that? Yeah, so um, Scandinavia looks really good in terms of happiness. Um, countries like Denmark and Sweden uh, characteristically um, have the happiest populations. And there's a lot of interesting debate about why that might be. Um, uh, it seems that you know providing a society in which people can count on some safety net, where people feel that they can trust their government, that they can depend on their neighbors. Um, These kinds of features seem to be really important for promoting uh, happiness. Um, And the good thing is, again, that they suggest there's things that governments can do to actually potentially improve their citizens' Mm -hmm. happiness. Do you know what happens when you take that, you know, the genetic um, Dane or other Scandinavian and bring them to uh, another, you know, do you... Do, do, have those studies been done where you're seeing what happens yeah. when you change the environment? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. So, you know, sometimes when I feel pessimistic about whether we can ever change people's happiness levels, mm-hmm. I remind myself about the studies along the lines of what you just described, where people actually move countries. And that's mm-hmm. where you see the biggest changes in people's happiness. And, and really the most striking changes would occur, you know, not moving someone from, say, Denmark to Sweden, that's not going to make a huge difference. But if you, um, there's some really remarkable work looking at um, Syrian refugees moving to countries like Canada. And there you see massive jumps in happiness. Um, So it does suggest that, you know, radically changing people's environment can radically change happiness levels. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to totally bust my husband right now, but we were having a conversation with my son this weekend about entitlement and um, trying to, you know, sort of get into his head the idea that not being entitled and being grateful things is not just a matter of it being annoying for us, you know, to have an entitled child is not just annoying for the parent, but it fosters, it makes them like less likely to be happy in life if they just expect everything. And, and he went as far as to say that, who do you think are happier in the world, wealthier people or less wealthy people? He, he seemed to, he asserted that less wealthy people are on average happier. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> or or wh- in what context might that be true or not true? Yeah, people would love to make that argument. The data <laughs> do not support the idea mm. that, that poorer people are happier than wealthy people. In fact, if there was one finding that I would say I'm completely confident in, it is that wealthier people are happier than poorer people. Like that's just mm. super clear. And especially, you know, living in a wealthier country is, is, you know, certainly linked to um, lots and lots of better outcomes, including higher mm-hmm. happiness. Um, so, yeah. Uh, however, that said, you know, wealth 
in a way, maybe doesn't do quite as much for people's happiness as we might expect. So wealthier people are clearly happier than poorer people overall, but there is a lot of overlap in the distribution. So you could, for sure, if you took a sample of 100 wealthy people and 100 mm -hmm. um, poor people, you would find, on average, the wealthier people were happier than the poorer people, but there would be some poor people that were happier than some of the wealthy people. So these are not, mm -hmm. these are overlapping um, mm -hmm. distributions. And one of the reasons why these distributions overlap as much as they do is that wealth has some negative effects. So wealth does all kinds of great things for us that I think we, sh we need to not overlook, especially when we're speaking from kind of a position of privilege. You know, it's really important to recognize that wealth insulates us from a lot of the slings and arrows of daily life. And indeed, in some of my research, we find that um, people who have more money are less likely to experience sadness on a, on a typical day. Um, but interestingly, levels of income aren't so clearly linked with more positive emotions on a mm. given day. So, um, and, and part of the reason that we think that's the case and we have some evidence is that um, the more money you have, the less inclined you are to appreciate what you have. And so going back to this issue of entitlement, wealth really does seem to generate this sense of entitlement that like I can get whatever I need on my own. I don't need to depend on others. And you know, I should have it, right? And so yeah. I don't necessarily need to appreciate every little thing that comes my way. So on the one hand, um, wealth gives you access to all of these lovely experiences, but, and that's important, but that beneficial effect is partially undercut by this tendency for um, wealthier people to just not appreciate all of those wonderful things quite as right. much. Right. So it is all about the balance of positive feelings to negative feelings. And the poor people are having more of the negative feelings um, because of that, the stress of that situation. Yeah. So the ideal thing, if you wanted to really promote happiness is, um, you know, go ahead and rack up the wealth, but appreciate it, right? Stop mm -hmm. and really somehow maintain your sense of like, your knowledge that, oh, this isn't something that you're automatically entitled to, that mm -hmm. it could change at any time, you know, and, and think about how you could perhaps use that wealth to, to benefit others. Mm -hmm. that, oh, that was good. So that's a perfect segue into, into your research, I guess. So, um, what, so you wrote a book, uh, and you've done Ted talks about some of the ways that you can actually spend your money in ways that foster more likely to foster happiness. So can you talk a bit about that? Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, so I started doing this work um, uh, when I was in my mid 20s and I suddenly started actually making money. Um, I'd been in grad school for many years and was pretty accustomed to living close to the poverty line. And then I got my faculty position at UBC and started like actually getting real adult sized paychecks. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, what, you know, what do I do with all of this money? Um, and so um, uh, I started thinking about uh, the existing literature in psychology, uh, which suggested that kindness is actually good for us, that being generous can actually be quite beneficial. And so I thought, okay, well, what if, you know, what if we took money and spent it on other people? And really just out of my own curiosity, I sent undergraduates out on our campus and, you know, we walked up to people and basically handed them money. Um, so we would give people a five or $20 bill in the morning and ask them to spend it by the end of the day. And um, we told half the people they had to spend it on somebody else, we told half the people they had to spend it on themselves. And then we called them back at the end of the day to see how they were doing. Um, and basically what we discovered was that people were happier when they spent this money on somebody else rather than on the themselves. Mm -hmm. um, now that was, you know, a small study. It was just right here in Vancouver. Um, but since then, we've replicated this effect uh, around the world. We see even in countries where people are struggling to meet their own basic needs, um, we still find this warm glow of giving where people feel happier when they use their resources mm -hmm. to benefit somebody else. And we even see it among very young children. Hmm. That's very cool. That reminds me, there was something that for, since I've done just a little bit of popular reading about happiness and, and money, I'm curious if this is if this is true. I remember reading that um, there's sort of this threshold effect where if you, if you there is actually an, a positive effect of money on happiness once to sort of get you out of desperation. But then once you're at a certain level of comfort, more is not necessarily better. Is there something to that? Right. So there's a famous, famous study by um, Danny Kahneman and Angus Deaton where they show that once people are making around 
$75,000 US additional income ceases to have any bearing whatsoever on how much people laugh or smile on a given mm. day. Um, however, um, you know, people's cognitive evaluations of their lives do tend to continue to tick upwards. So again, it sort of okay. depends on which aspect of happiness you're looking at. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, money does seem to, or additional income does seem to be fairly effective at promoting people's evaluations of their lives. Mm -hmm. It's just money is like not the greatest when it comes to delivering positive emotions. So there's other factors that seem to be more important than money um, in giving us these moments of joy and contentment on a typical mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to spending money on others for joy, did it, did it seem to matter how much you spend or like what are some of the other determinants of, of the outcome? Yeah, so we find that what really matters is whether you can see the impact or understand the impact that your generosity is having. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you um, just kind of go on a website and donate some money and don't really have any idea how it's going to make a difference, that form of giving can be pretty unrewarding. So mm -hmm. um, it's not the case that, you know, just lightening your wallet automatically will make you right. happier. Um, instead, it's about really being able to either have a direct window into um, how your generosity is making a difference, you know, which could be that like you give your niece a basketball for Christmas or her birthday and then you go over and play with her and you see she's like so happy and you're having a great time. You know, that's a classic just one on one giving experience. Um, mm -hmm. But with charities, you know, potentially we can do this too, right? So some charities do a really nice job of giving their donors a clear window into um, how the beneficiaries are, um, you know, how their lives are being improved by by the donations. Um, so impact really matters. We also see it matters whether you have a sense of connection with the cause that you're helping. So do you really feel connected to the people or to the, the cause that you're helping? And then finally, do you have a choice? So at least in Western culture, we see that um, people don't like to be forced to do anything mm -hmm. and giving is really no exception. So when people feel like they've been sort of backed into a corner, like uh, think of those people that, you know, come up to you on the sidewalk and say, Hey, right. you want to give money? You kind of maybe do just to like yeah. escape the situation. Um, that also seems to be not the greatest in terms of yes. promoting um, <laughs> emotional reward. So you really want to find those giving opportunities where you can see the impact that you're having. You feel a real sense of connection with the people or cause you're helping and you have a choice about how and when to give. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to change gears a little bit because I just happened to listen to you on a podcast uh, about smartphones and how they impact, you know, our, our I guess, positive ness of our experience that we had. So can you t tell us a little bit about that research? Yeah, sure. So I got really interested in this um, uh, about eight years or so ago when I noticed that um, a lot of social interactions were increasingly permeated by our smartphones. So I would be at dinner with friends and people would sort of start pulling out their phones. And I thought, huh, you know, this is pretty interesting because we know that face to face social interactions are the most critical factor for promoting happiness. Mm -hmm. And now they're being to some extent fragmented by these devices, which, of course, were designed to connect us. Um, so we started doing um, studies to look at this because everyone had a theory about how, you know, the effects of phones, but there was just very little actual rigorous research trying to examine uh, these questions. Um, so for example, in one experiment, we um, uh, basically took over a table at a local restaurant for about six months. Um, and uh, every night we would uh, bring in a group of friends or family members to come have dinner together. We would pick up the tab um, in exchange for them being in our study. Uh, and we um, very subtly manipulated whether they had access to their phones during this meal. So for half the people, we said, oh, we're going to text you a survey halfway through the meal. So make sure you have your phones out and available um, on the table other half of groups we said oh you know we're going to bring you a survey over on paper and oh as a like minor housekeeping detail can you put your phones away during during the meal um and then we just left people alone to have their dinner um and then at the end of the uh meal we asked them to complete a longer survey um and uh what we discovered was that when people had access to their phones during this dinner out with friends and family uh they enjoyed it significantly less 
compared to uh, groups that did not have access to their phones. And, you know, I think it's really important not to exaggerate this finding. It's, it made a lot of headlines. And, you know, I saw people saying, oh, like, phones ruin social life. And right. it, phones don't ruin social life, right? It was, people still enjoyed themselves when they were at a table with their friends and everyone had their phones out. Um, but uh, we just saw a slight diminishment, right, where it was kind of undercutting their enjoyment. And so this suggests that, you know, if you are lucky enough to be going out with friends or family for dinner now, you should be perhaps considering prompting everybody to put their phones away because mm -hmm. we now know that this seems to significantly enhance mm -hmm. enjoyment. I mean, I, it seems to me that given the huge amount of inter individual variation, it would be hard to get a statistically significant effect if you're not, you're not testing the same person in two different settings. You're testing across people, right? It's, that seems hard to... Yes. Hard Welcome to, to the challenge yeah. of psychology, right? Like, yeah. This is the big challenge that we face. And so this is why we run hundreds and hundreds of people over a period of many months um, yeah. is to um, get enough power to be able to detect these differences. And certainly, like, you know, I was saying before about dis distributions, um, there's, um, you know, a, a range, right? So there may be some groups where everyone has their phones out, and they still have a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. um, but we see that, you know, across hundreds of different groups, that overall, there is this detectable difference where the groups who had their phones were a little bit worse off than people who, who didn't have their phones. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, it would, Again, to me, it's it's very surprising you could pull that off given that every dinner party is going to have such a different experience and such different going in there with their sort of set happiness levels, right? Right, so. that's true. And so we do try as much as we can to eliminate um, you know, excessive variation. So that's why, you know, we always had people at the same table in the same restaurant. Mm -hmm. Um, so when, like we were sending some people to a Michelin starred restaurant and other people to a roadside cafe, you mm -hmm. know, that aspect was always controlled. Um, we were always asking people to come in with, you know, people that they wanted to have dinner with. So yeah. in that way it was, a, you know, a somewhat consistent experience, but you're absolutely right that, um, you know, there is both just sort of noise. And then there's also this interesting source of variability, which is that some groups may tolerate the use of phones better than, than other groups do, right? And mm -hmm. so one thing I always encourage people to do is to think about experimenting on themselves, right? So, you know, it's possible we see this you know, effect is holds up for uh, across hundreds of people, but it doesn't mean that it's true for every single individual. So, so try it out, right? Try yeah. putting your phone away or encouraging all your friends to put their phones away and then see if you feel better than, you know, you did when you had your phone, um, phone out. I actually did that experiment to myself after I listened to your podcast and it was like, it was very, it was transformative. I feel like oh, if wow. I just, and having just, even when I'm working, um, Normally my phone's on my table, and then if I just stick it in my bag so I don't see it, uh, even though I have it on vibrate and I don't plan to check it, and I have it with the do not disturb mode, all that stuff. If I if I put it away, and similarly at home, if I don't, you know, when I'm with the kids, it's usually in my pocket or something. I, and I don't now. I'm just okay. I want it to be out of sight, so in a different room, so I can go get it. And I'm telling people to call me instead of text me. Yeah, we'll see how I think long, that's a great we'll see idea. how long I last. But it seems to be. I feel like the upside of of not having it sort of calling your name uh, is mm -hmm. uh, is way worth the you know the few calls you might miss. My husband might argue otherwise, but <laughs> well, right. And it's interesting, you know, we have a landline, um, and so you know, people who really need to get through to us could call the mm -hmm. landline, which I think is kind of an interesting, like forgotten opportunity, right? right? It's like because uh, sometimes people really do need to get through to you, but I would mm -hmm. say. 90% of the texts and notifications and stuff that I receive on a given day, I don't absolutely need right in that moment. Yes. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting you mentioned being at home with your kids because we find we've also done research um, at Science World, Science mm -hmm. Museum in Vancouver, where oh, well. <laughs> um, really whether people have access to their phones or whether they're checking their phones a lot when they're spending time with their kids. And again, we see um, that people find this experience of spending time with their kids at Science World less meaningful when they're checking their phones a lot compared to when they're putting their phones away. Um, so I, I have to be honest, this is a piece of advice. I have a hard time hmm. reliably practicing, yeah. but when I can make myself do it, you know, it really is helpful because yeah. human beings aren't great at switching attention from one thing to the next. And it, mm. it takes us a surprisingly long time to get 
fully back after yeah. we let our attention dart over to our phone. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think even just creating one hour a night, right, where you put your yes. phone away can be, can be pretty powerful. Yes. You know, I have to say, what, for me and phone, you know, with kids, I find that um, I, I think, oh, I'll sneak in this. They're happily playing for these two minutes. I'm going to sneak in this one thing. And then I don't get to finish the thing. And then I feel this little bit of resentment that they're not letting me finish it. But then I feel guilty for being resentful because I'm actually supposed to be with them. So it messes with my mind. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you're not alone. I mean, I think that kind of, um, you know, even people who think they're mul- good at multitasking generally are not. Um, and so uh, the more we can kind of give the people we care about some focused attention, I think mm-hmm. not only we recognize that our children will benefit, but it's, I think what's interesting is we benefit too. For sure. That's uh, part of part of this entitlement book that I'm reading <laughs> all about actually recommends just say, just give your kids 10 focused minutes and that yeah. can work wonders. And, and it's kind of embarrassing that you don't actually normally do that, right? 100% attention. Yeah, I think attention is a form of generosity, right? Something mm-hmm. that we can give to other people mm-hmm. that is actually, you know, a, in a really important resource that we sometimes think we can just splinter among different tasks. Um, mm-hmm. But if we can really just devote it to the thing that we care about the most um, the, in that at that time, you know, there's a real benefit to be had. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And certainly you that checks the boxes of a cause you care about. And when you can see the kids just light up right when they mm-hmm. see they they've got you 100%. So what else? Um, oh, so yeah, the other um, aspect of your research that has been more, more recent, uh, maybe we can just talk about some of your recent re- recent work more broadly. But the one that I'm particularly aware of is some of the um, impacts of the pandemic on happiness and how that's uh, different between different individuals. Yeah, so uh, I've been really interested to understand how the pandemic is affecting people's feelings of well-being, and particularly their feelings of social connection, because I think one of the most um, unifying experiences of the pandemic, although we've all of course experienced it somewhat differently but um is is that you know we've had this need for physical distancing um Mm -hmm. and so uh, what does it mean that we can't so easily have real face-to-face interactions with Mm -hmm. with people um and to be honest you know i anticipated that uh we would see plummeting levels of social connection that we would see really devastating effects in terms of mental health and so we went out and we collected um, data and, you know, the portrait that we see in front of us is actually much more reassuring than I would have anticipated. So um, we, what we were able to do, we had uh, measured uh, levels of social connection and levels of well-being um, back in January and February with two different samples. One a sample of students at the University of British Columbia, another a sample of adults um, across the U.S., the U.K., and a smattering of other countries. Um, and so we were able to follow up with those very mm-hmm. same individuals um, in um, early April, um, kind of in the height of COVID-related restrictions, mm-hmm. um, and basically ask them the same questions that we had um, before the pandemic right smack in the middle of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to my surprise, you know, people didn't change that much. Again, this is the stability mm-hmm. we were talking about at the beginning, like people's levels of social connection, their levels of loneliness were largely unchanged. So we saw a slight drop among our students in terms of feelings of social connection. But among the adults um, across uh, the US and UK, we actually saw a slight improvement in terms of loneliness, which was Hmm. like, we kept checking the data and going, are we, do we, someone must have coded this wrong, like what happened here? And then we thought, did we just get some kind of weird sample? Like what, what went on? And, but what we're seeing is other people, other researchers are finding the same effect with other data sets that, you know, interestingly, at least in this initial phase of the pandemic, people have been doing okay, like maintaining their feelings of social connection, maintaining their feelings of life satisfaction, 
which, you know, is fascinating. And I think just speaks to the resilience of, of human beings that we are able, even when we're facing a very difficult situation, we're able to, for example, find other ways to connect. So yeah, I can't go um, chat with the barista at Starbucks or see, you know, parents at my kid's school that I normally run into or have work meetings in person. But instead, we're doing things like Zoom calls and, you know, standing out on our decks, cheering with neighbors um, and, you know, con connecting in some cases with old friends. I had Zoom calls with, you know, friends mm -hmm. of mine from college that I hadn't talked to yes. for a while. Um, yes. And so, um, you know, there's this argument in psychology that uh, human human beings have a fundamental need to belong, to connect. That's sort of like the need to eat or the need to sleep. And so you will find a way to fill that need. You know, take mm. away your favorite foods, you'll find something else to eat. You know, and so you won't actually just let yourself go hungry. Um, and and that seems to be what we're what we're seeing now. To be clear, that doesn't mean that like we'll never see troubling mental health effects from the pandemic, right? So, you know, I think if things were to, if restrictions were to stay in place for a really long time or keep coming back so that people would feel this sense of kind of learned helplessness, or if we were to really see diminished hope for a vaccine, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's possible that these negative effects could arise. It's also important to recognize that about 10% of our sample did show really you know, substantial declines in their sense of connection. So there were people mm -hmm. that were having a hard time. It's just to our surprise, they were sort of the the minority rather than reflecting, you know, what most people were actually experiencing. Yeah. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, at least the, the UBC students are probably okay financially, and so this was certainly hit. You know, th those that are having these sort of massive economic consequences to me would be the ones that would be most likely to to offer a big hit, or or those that don't have the the means to connect socially uh, online as well because they're not part of that generation or there's yeah, yeah I think there's probably work being done to figure out what are the at risk populations I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and you know economically speaking, our sample of adults across the U.S. and the U.K. were not in a not in a high income bracket hmm. typically. So you know even among these people that were you know, agreeing to participate in studies for a fairly small amount of pay. So they're not generally the highest income folks. Okay. We were still seeing this relatively high degree of resilience hmm. among them. So, you know, and UBC students do, I would say, run the gamut in terms yeah. of socioeconomic background. And we didn't see that um, their parents' SES Mm -hmm. had, or their parents' um, household income or education had much of a bearing on how well they were doing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I mean, it's certainly people who were going through massive economic stress, I would absolutely expect that they would experience bigger declines in terms of their overall, overall well-being. Um, but again, in, in this research, our focus was really on social connection because we mm -hmm. wanted to understand the effects of, of physical distancing. Right. And right. kind of across the income spectrum, we were seeing people just finding a way to maintain this critical sense of connection. Mm -hmm. It seems to me there's also this sense of community that's in, in some ways stronger and fighting a common enemy mm -hmm. and looking out for others. There, I, I feel like there's that's I've seen a lot of positive um, energy uh, in that direction. Absolutely. And I think that's something to really keep in mind is like that. Um, when there's a collective trauma, people respond to it often by coming together. And I think mm -hmm. you know, that's happening probably in some communities more than others. I feel lucky that we live in a community where I think that really has happened. Um, there has been a really nice sense of, of coming together. I think um, that I believe, although we don't have clear evidence for this, but I believe that has helped to, to buffer people from some of the negative emotional consequences of this uh, mm -hmm. situation. Well, that's, that's very encouraging. <laughs> yeah, some of those predictions about mental health were pretty dire, uh, some reports that I've seen. Yeah, and there's still news stories out there saying, oh, you know, the um, we're in a mental health crisis and so forth. And, you know, most of the researchers are kind of going, yeah, we get that makes sense, but that's not what we actually see right. in the data. And, you right. know, again, it is in no way to diminish the fact that there certainly are people suffering out there. It's mm -hmm. just that that is not the, the modal experience. It's not, mm -hmm. it's, it's not as common as we might think. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great that we're, we're turning out to be so resourceful. <laughs> well, yeah, human beings in general are just more 
resilient than we ourselves typically recognize. So, yeah. you know, there's a whole bunch of research showing that uh, kind of whatever bad thing happens to you, even something as terrible as losing a spouse, people tend to bounce back within a couple of years and actually return to their original levels of life satisfaction mm -hmm. um, with a speed that I think is kind of mind blowing. Yeah. Well, that, that's really good to bear in mind for anyone who might be going through, um, you know, a, a personal crisis. Mm -hmm. It's very encouraging. I want to be mindful of time, so let's move to our kind of wrap-up segment here. And and I wanted to ask you here again. There's you know so many different aspects of happiness. So what are some of the practical tips that maybe you implement and that you would recommend to others, and and some that maybe you even if you don't implement them yourself, that you you would recommend for those looking for uh, a boost either in pandemic life or just in general. Sure thing. Um, well, so one that I certainly put into practice is. Um, to uh, try to make time every day or almost every day for some physical exercise because there's evidence, of course we know that physical exercise is good for health, um, but there's also very clear evidence that it's good for happiness. There's you know, some research, maybe we should take with a grain of salt, but some research suggesting that physical exercise might be almost as good as therapy in terms of promoting um, mental well-being. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, and, and what's interesting about it, too, is exercise seems to be good um, at promoting long term life satisfaction, but it also promotes an immediate benefit for mood. Um, and so mm -hmm. in some of my research, we've tried to figure out, well, then why doesn't everyone be so excited to like rush to the gym and work yeah. out or go for a run? And what we've discovered is that um, people tend to focus on the very initial phase of exercise. And so mm -hmm. the, often the first few minutes of exercise are genuinely unpleasant. You're not warmed up. You're start running and it feels kind of terrible. Um, and so that initial phase of exercise tends to dominate people's expectations. Mm -hmm. So if you can just spread people's attention to the whole thing or introduce a really positive beginning, sort of like doing Shavasana at the, at the uh, start, for example, uh, um, that this can make people more inclined to to want to want to exercise. So that's that's probably the yes. number one thing that I do in my life is no matter how busy I am, I try to make time for some physical exercise. And of course, how do you make time? Well, one of the big um, strategies that I certainly employ that's based on my own research is to think about buying time, um, which is to think about whether there's any tasks that you really dread and then consider whether you can possibly afford a way to buy yourself out of some of those tasks. And we find in our research that people who use money to buy their way out of spending time doing the things that they despise tend to be happier. Um, and in fact, if we just give people money and tell them to spend it um, on uh, on buying themselves some time, we see they're happier on a given day. Um, so this is definitely a strategy that I've implemented in my own life. Um, so for example, last fall, I had a really busy um, work term and so I hired a family helper who would do all our little random errands. She would cut up vegetables for my seven-year-old so that when we got home, there were already vegetables mm -hmm. kind of cut up and out. Um, dinner would sort of be prepped so I could like have the feeling of cooking, but like really it was the, all the hard work and really time consuming right. bits of like washing and chopping and everything were already done. Um, so those are really two of the big things that I very consistently do and have seen not only in the data, but also in my own life really seem to be valuable in promoting promoting day-to-day -day happiness. Um, one tip we talked about earlier but you said you're still working on implementing is is the putting the phone away. Is there anything else that's in that category that uh, maybe there's some some hurdles that can be hard to overcome but might be worth it if you can? Yeah so um, one uh, strategy that that can be really good for happiness is to engage in a meditation practice. Mm. I cannot make myself do this and I was chatting with one of the um, uh, researchers who's done some of the foundational work in this area, she can't make herself meditate either, even though she, she did one of the really famous studies showing that meditation is good for happiness. Um, so yeah, you know, I think you have to kind of pick and choose from the grab bag. Mm -hmm. There is no one activity that everyone has to do in order to be happy. You kind of have to find your own blend. You have to find the stuff that works for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if you just can't put your phone away or you can't meditate, you know, there's lots of other ways to be happy. And there's, um, you know, it, it's about finding the activities I think that you can that you can stick with. Mm -hmm. So how can people find out more about your work? Um, as we wrap up here, if they want to learn more, because there's Yeah, there's so much more that we couldn't cover today. Uh, so I'm on Twitter at done happy lab. Um, and uh, 
if they Google my name, Elizabeth Dunn, I pop up pretty fast. Um, and all of my publications and a lot of media stories I've written and a lot of media stories about my work um, are available online. I also encourage um, people to check out my uh, TED 2019 talk um, for more about the science of giving. Um, and yeah, we're always come producing uh, new work and there's even mm. a chance to get involved by in participating in studies. So oh, if you very cool. go visit my website, um, there's an opportunity to participate in some of our happiness studies and, and really get involved. Cool. Is there any one study that's going to be reading out relatively soon that you're excited about or are they all kind of a ways away? Yeah. Yeah, so um, what we're trying to do now is really understand how we can um, maximize the benefits of interactions that are happening remotely over platforms such as Zoom, ah. because of course, this is a major feature of our social lives these days. And so we really want to understand how to optimize um, these video communications so that we can get the maximum benefits out of them. So we're running studies right now on this topic. Anyone can be part of these studies oh, wow. um, and the opportunity to, to get involved is on our website. Oh, that's awesome. You guys are great at doing really timely work. It's, you can obviously cook up a study yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah, I get bored easily, so I'm always <laughs> always trying to do new stuff. And, I, you know, I'm really guided. I feel very fortunate to have a job where I can just be guided by my own curiosity. So whatever mm -hmm. is, you know, making me curious at the time mm -hmm. is what we'll often, you know, quickly try to, to start studying. That's amazing. Well, thank you for letting me satisfy my curiosity about happiness today. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really a really lot of fun, and I learned a lot. So thank you. My pleasure. We'll get to chat uh, again sometime. Fun. For sure, that would be great. And maybe now you've made me more curious to learn more about some of the genetics. So I'm going to go back <laughs> to some of those studies and learn more. Well, yeah, let me know what you find. <laughs> great. Thank okay. you. Take care, Liz. Bye. Thanks. Bye.